Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome back. My name is Lisa Jarrett, and I am one of the co-founders and co-directors of Chaos Mocha, or the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School Museum of Contemporary Art. We're a contemporary art museum located inside Dr. MLK Elementary School in Northeast Portland, Oregon. And this is our 2021 Remote Visiting Artists um, Residency and Lecture Series. Uh, this morning, we are starting off our third round of artist talks from our fantastic group of artists uh, this term, and we'll be featuring work today from Ilya Yakovenko, and you'll hear a little bit more about Ilya from Mo in just a moment. I just wanted to make sure to send a warm welcome out to the Dr. MLK Junior School students who are watching this via our YouTube live channel. Welcome. We miss you all so much. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like us to share with the artist, please feel free to put those in the chat and we'll make sure that Ilya has an opportunity to answer those at the end of the talk. I'm joined today by my co-founder, colleague, and co-director, Harold Fletcher, and uh, Amanda Lee Evans, who's one of our primary collaborators and project directors and coordinators, along with a group of Portland State University undergraduate students. And our project is a collaboration between Portland State University School of Art and Design and Dr. MLK Junior School. I want to also make sure to thank the Dr. MLK Junior School staff who helped support all of this work, including Jill Sage, the principal, Nancy Rios, Michelle Peake, and, uh, oh, I'm forgetting somebody, Michelle Peake, and who else? Paige Thomas. How could I forget Paige? Uh, who really helps put all of this together for us and really helps us connect with our students and our families in the community. So thank you guys so much for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to Mo so that we can welcome our artists for today. Hello, I, hi, I'm Mo. I am a student at Dr. Martin Luther Hey, Mo, I lost your sound. Can you unmute real quick? Sorry, do you want me to start over? Yes, please, that would be great. Hi, I'm Mo. I go to, I am a student at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School. I am an artist and the KS Mocha head photographer. I'll be introducing Ilya Yakovenko today. This is his third talk this school year. Congratulations! We are excited to learn more new things about his art. I am too. Ilya is a cultural worker, artist, curator, poet, spectator, and cultural ambassador to Portland. That is a lot of jobs. Ilya is also an MFA student in art and social practice at PSU, who came to study in the US from Ukraine. For KS Mocha, Ilya is working with students on the in International Acquisition Committee to bring art from around the world to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. For what? This sounds cool. Um, Ilya spent his childhood in Mariupol, Eastern Ukraine. This region is currently dealing with war. I am very sorry. To heal. to heal, imagine, and build a more equi equitable, inclusive, and safe future, Ilya is learning to explore history, memories, cultures, and identities with art. That is a lot of studying. Ilya, Ilya likes to make art projects with other people. That is awesome. Thank you for being here today at KS Maka. Welcome, Ilya. Thank you. Thank you, Mo, uh, Lisa. By the um, way, Kiss. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to see you. Thank you, Lisa, Amanda, Mo, Harold, and Kiss Mocha for uh, having me here. Uh, and today, uh, I think, yeah, today I, I'm not going to actually talk about my work uh, so much. I, um, I'm rather uh, talk about works of of uh, other artists from Ukraine and show you some uh, excerpts or you know share sh share uh, the work from from this artist and yeah so that's really exciting and just to situate my talk in uh, relationship to the other talk that I um, have given already so my first talk was about like a little bit introduction about Kismoka International Acquisitions Committee uh, I told about my 
self, my personal story, and also like showed the collection of uh, of uh, uh, Soviet coins and Soviet uh, badges and pins that um, I have in my possession. And yeah, and try to tell you, you know, stories about like what stories these objects can tell about the region and about the history of the region. Uh, and during my second talk, I told mostly about the work, about my own work, or in that specific case, uh, I focused mostly on the work by the cooperative of, of uh, for creative research Krasnashpana, which I am a member of, and I want to shout out to uh, uh, other members of the cooperative, uh, Alexey Markin and Olga Shurkastup. Uh, yeah, we did a great, great job. Uh, I really think our project was amazing. Uh, projects were amazing, and uh, yeah, and so I told, told about the work, and uh, again, uh, the point was to, or my idea was to, through uh, the story of the work of these artworks that we did, tell the story of the region, and like, tell the story of the, uh, like the specificities and the, uh, yeah, and what the region is going through right now, uh, these days, today. Um, and yeah, and this talk will be about artists from Ukraine. Uh, some of them I know personally, some of them I don't know personally, but I still find their work uh, super relevant and super interesting. And uh, some of the artists even recorded their like uh, introductions and their comments about videos, uh, about their works. And so I will show, show uh, these uh, things to you, like their uh, introductions, their video uh, messages. Uh, to you and one artist is even may, maybe join us uh, uh, closer to the end of the presentation. Also, like to tell a little bit about um, his work and uh, and uh, yeah, answer your questions. Uh, so let's start. First work uh, I wanted to share with you um, is uh, Donbas uh, Odyssey. Uh, and this is the work by uh, Dariot Simbaluk, uh, Yulia Filipieva, and uh, Viktor Zasipkin. I don't actually know the exact date of the work. I think it's, um, I suspect it's 2013, 2015. Uh, and yeah, I don't think if it's, on, if, I don't really know if it's ongoing or not. But um, I find this work very interesting because it explores stories of the people uh, from the Donetsk region, the region where I'm from and where is the conflict is, is going on right now. And so it's specifically like the artists, they reach, they kind of met with people who were internally displaced by the war and right now are living, you know, as uh, refugees, basically internally displaced people in the territories that are controlled by Ukrainian government. And so they had interview with people and um, created mind maps uh, of the places where the people are from. And I will show you the video by uh, uh, Dariet Simbaluk, her, uh, her video uh, message to us all. Uh, and she, yeah, she will introduce uh, the work a little bit. We'll talk about the work. Ah, by the way, am I sharing my screen? I'm not sharing my screen, right? Uh, yeah, I forgot to share my screen. That's perfect. Uh, yeah, I'll share my screen now. And while I'm doing that, I also want to say, uh, just mentioned that I will be talking about the works, but I'm like, that's my own perspective and my own interpretation of the works, right? I'm not an art historian. Uh, I'm just an artist and I just want to share the works that I find relevant and interesting. But uh, definitely, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm not an expert. I'm not pretend to be an expert and be, uh, yeah, I, I'll try to be as, uh, as uh, precise as possible, not to uh, you know uh, make any mistakes in terms of description of the work. But yeah, I I can do that. And uh, sorry for that. And this is um, sorry to the artists who watch this video later. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm sharing my screen. Now you probably see my screen. Um, but I'm not sure if you have sound, so I'll have to double check and share it again. Yeah, you will have sound. Uh, and uh, here we go. at the moment I'm in Scotland, but I actually spent four years in the United States, in Ohio, where I went to college. So how much you know about Ukraine? 
you probably heard in the news and unfortunately in 2014 um, a war broke out and it's still ongoing and there were lots of people moving from the conflict areas they were, they were fleeing to save their lives and so I was in Ukraine at that moment and together with two colleagues Yulia Filipeva and Viktor Zasetkin we started this project called Donbass Odyssey you probably heard of Homer and the famous Odyssey he wrote so the Odyssey as a journey as a kind of long journey this um, internally displaced people or migrants who were, were undertaken to go to other cities and Donbass is the name of the, of the region where they were migrating from and so what we wanted to do is to actually just talk to people about their cities uh, that they left the, you know, the memories of hometowns um, so we interviewed people grown-ups and kids all kinds of people between the ages of 70 and, and 10 and we asked them to draw a map of their hometown and so th that's actually something you can do and I challenge you to do it, it's really fun. So you just take a piece of paper, it would be also really fun if you do it together and especially if you live in, in, the same, in the same district. So you take a piece of paper, you take colorful pencils and felt pens and you just map as you remember them, as you imagine them, the, the kind of the, the favorite places of your neighborhood. It could be a cafe, it could be a library, it could be a park, you're going to play, um, you know, places something happened. So this is really just kind of remembering uh, your neighborhood and that's what we've done with the people who migrated from this region and then we just we just shared the stories we shared them in the streets so there would be stickers and there would be maps on the wall so if you can't you can just you know you walk and you see it we also exhibit in the galleries and we've done a lot of workshops we would we would do it together with um with people or, you know with, with people like you with anybody anybody was welcome to kind of remember and, and, and understand this experience so yeah so that's that's it from me Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, talk to Ilya. He will share my contacts. Have a good day. Ciao. Uh, yeah, thank you, Daria. Thank you, Daria, so much for recording this amazing video. Now I'll show the work itself, but I will again double uh, check that I'm showing my desktop because that's uh, important. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Daria. Um, uh, yeah, and um, now I'm showing, uh, yeah, it's already, but um I'll just say the boss. and here's the project website i just wanted to show you some of the mind maps that they uh that they uh kind of uh drew with the participants uh of the project and so this is how this this yeah th this is how these maps look like and do you have a name of a person, like a small excerpt from the interview and uh, uh, the mind map? And I just wanted to show you one of the mind maps that resonated with me a lot. And it, yeah, when I was like going through the website, I was really impressed how one person from Donetsk, uh, which is like this is a, um, the center of the like administrative center of the Donetsk region, and it kind of became uh, the kind of so-called capital of the so-called like say, say self-proclaimed uh breakaway states uh, uh or breakaway state and as people republic um uh, which is uh, basically a pro-russian and russian supported uh uh military uh, occupation of the of the uh ukrainian territory and so this city the nets the mind map yep no, it's not this one. Huh. Probably missed it. Um, I'm really sorry. Yeah, this one. Uh, so Alexei, 34 years old, Makivka, Donetsk. Uh, Makivka is a satellite um, town of Donetsk. And you know, when I first saw this uh, this map, I was like really stri like uh, streaking or stroke. Yeah, I, yeah, it was strikingly similar to how I remember the city and how I imagine in a way the city as well. So this is like relates very well to my own my mental map of Donetsk. And uh, yeah, so here like the places where I remember quite quite well and where I was uh, hanging out a lot. And uh, I do remember like names of the streets. So uh, this is the street that I would enter the uh, city because like this is Lenin's prospect and uh, uh, this is the uh, prospect like this is the road that uh, connects my hometown 
uh, Mariupol and Donetsk. And yeah, every time I come from Donetsk, it will be like uh, to Donetsk, it will be like um, using the street. And here in the corner, uh, there is a bus station, uh, intercity bus station. And here is the uh, Golden Ring, which is a uh, which is a mall. And uh, then there is this uh, circus. Uh, and I was living nearby the circus for a few, I think like when I was uh, uh, on the, like a freshman, my freshman year at uh, university. And uh, yeah, I lived in the Netherlands because I, I studied in the university and I lived there like for four years approximately. But then even after, after I left the Netsk and uh, um, left Ukraine even, so I, I moved out of Ukraine, but then every time I visited my hometown, every time I visit my Mariupol and my parents in Mariupol, I would always go to the Netsk for at least a few days or maybe even like, like a week or two to visit my friends and hang out there. And uh, there is the spot. Um, so this is a, uh, the market. And then there is a spot where we hang out uh, like a canteen and uh, kind of bar or a, a cafe where we hang out a lot. And this is like the uh, Ilicia prospect. And nearby, one of my friends uh, had an apartment. And so we kind of, uh, I stayed in this apartment a lot. And now uh, the friend eventually have to uh, leave the, uh, the, like flee the city as well. And so since 2014, basically since the city got occupied by the uh, Russians and since, since the uh, war started, I, yeah, I have never been back in the city. So um, also miss it, miss it a lot and we can, and then see what this person, Alexei, is saying about this mind map. Um, so yeah, our I'll just read it out loud. Uh, our expectations were a little bit different. People are people. Usually they don't notice anything beyond their own interests. We expected Kyiv, which is the capital city of Ukraine, we expected Kyiv to be warmer, uh, warmer, uh, closer in terms of uh, people's reaction. But it happened to be the other way. And until today, I meet people who live in their own absolutely different reality. If you go beyond their understanding of a situation I was witnessing there, in the best case, they stop talking. In the worst case, begin to over persuade you that everything is not the way you think it is. Reaction could be either aggressive, indifferent, or a person tries to avoid the dialogue in general. And uh, so, yeah, it's basically a conversation about the person's, uh, exp like the Alexei's experience of being an internally displaced person in a way. And so this is what the person experienced while they are uh, in the territories that are mm, controlled by Ukrainian government, specifically in Kyiv. But yeah, so the sense of frustration, the sense of people not understanding like them and what does it mean to be an internally displaced person and um, uh, lose your place like where you grew up or your home. Uh, in a way, not being able to go back uh, because of uh, a number of reasons. And I just want, as a reference, uh, yeah, just tell, like, as Daria said, uh, it's very interesting how, uh, in a way, everyone can do a similar thing. Uh, and it's just in this specific case, the people who share their mental maps of the uh, areas that they remember and they feel they. Uh, have like have some, some personal relationship uh, to or with. Uh, yeah, and it's just in this case, it happened that these areas that they don't have any access to anymore. But in, you know, our case on, or in your case, let's say, when was the last time you've been to King's school, right? And, um, you know, you can also like just draw a map of, uh, you know, the neighborhood around King School or like how the King School looks inside, uh, like what are the places you like about King School stuff. So yeah, it's very easy to everyone to kind of do this exercise. And I think it can be really fun and interesting and can also tell all a lot about the, uh, you know, the places and what people value in these places and uh, uh, what they miss in these places. And yeah, basically it's like an individual personal story of a person about the place they uh, they uh, they they have personal connections too, uh, and uh, just a small reference I want to show you again. Like this is like part of my work, but this is was the last time when I went to the Netsk. It was in 2014, and back then already like the city administration uh, was uh, occupied by the protesters, pro-Russian protesters, 
so you see kind of Russian flags and stuff. And yeah, this was <laughs> apparently like the last picture that I've ever taken in the city. And I remember like there was a moment when I was like still at my friend's place and I had like a train or something to leave, leave the city like in, in two days because yeah, I was like in transit basically. Uh, and then my mother called me and like, she was like, so you are in the nest, like go, you know, you have to get out of there because you know, like the war will start. So yeah, just get out of there like immediately as soon as you can. And I was like, oh, whatever, I'll just, you know, hang out for the couple more days. Uh, and then the other person, uh, uh, Peter Manovsky, who will join us, I do remember maybe on this same exact day when I kind of ran into him and he was like shooting a video or like a film and he was like going inside the building actually because like he was like kind of as a documentary filmmaker he was like trying to capture what's going on inside and yeah just uh, a reference uh, uh, and uh, now I'm gonna move to another work uh, by Alftina Kahidze and she is a great artist who lives uh, in, in Kiev, or not even in Kiev, but in a smaller village or town uh, near Kiev. And uh, I don't know her personally, but I really uh, yeah, love her work. And this work's name, um, like the, the title of the work is uh, Strawberry and Andre uh, Ravener, which is uh, which is a story or work about, or maybe in collaboration or about your mother. And um, basically for this work, what she did, she, because her mother, she lives or she lived on the territories that are occupied by, you know, pro-Russian separatists and by Russian military force. So her mother stayed and, Keep living, like uh, keep living in this territory despite the war, despite the occupation, and uh, she didn't want to move to the territories that are occupied, uh, that, that are uh, controlled by Ukrainian government, because she just, you know, yeah, she didn't want to like leave home, and uh, she decided to stay. And uh, uh, Alftina, she uh, was uh, having phone conversations with her almost like not every day but quite often and she was recording uh these conversations and then making some small drawings and then sharing the drawings and conversations and this kind of became a very interesting and in a way even like tragic story interesting because she was like having this you know everyday conversations with her mother about like oh so what are you doing like uh, you know, how the things are going, how the weather is uh, uh, in, uh, uh, yeah, like how the weather is, or how, like, did you already uh, planted the seeds that you wanted to plant in your garden and stuff. Uh, but then, yeah, on the other hand, this topic of war, of war and like of, you know, you know like military uh, armed clashes was also coming up and, uh, yeah, and eventually uh, her mother died when she was passing through the check checkpoint uh, from from the occupied territory to Ukraine. Uh, because like many internally displaced people, like many older people, they have to do that in order to keep getting their like retirement payments. Because uh, yeah, this is something that Ukraine kind of uh, I don't know, like this is a mandatory requirement. So if you, if you want to get like keep getting your uh, retirement payments, like your pension, um, you have to cross the uh, the demarcation line, the territory to get to Ukraine to kind of <clears throat> check in that you are still, yeah, that you are still kind of I don't know alive or that you are kind of uh, yeah have. Whatever. I mean, it's complicated. It's a very weird and you know problematic policy, but it exists, and so many uh, senior people have to uh, seniors have to cross the border back and forth uh, quite often. And yeah, and so it happened that uh, unfortunately, uh, her mother uh, died during the 
crossing and uh, uh, I will show you the video where Elftina kind of shares the a little bit about her work and uh, uh, tells a story about of, of her work and of her mother. Как только все началось, война началась, мама называла это Катавасией. Для меня тогда появились непонятно почему российские флаги. Я тогда почувствовала, что мне нужно срочно про все, что там происходит, писать и рисовать то, что мне мама рассказывает. Четырнадцатое августа. У нас график такой. С шести постреляли, а потом вечером. С восьми. Как стемнеет. Вот такой спектакль, Аля. Я пошла молча и заплатила за коммунальные. А люди не платят. Мол, война. Зачем? А я им говорю, насчитают вам пеню, будете потом знать. И не закрывают ничего. Ни помидоры, ни варенье. Нет настроения, говорят. А я закрываю. Думаю, придете ко мне зимой, когда война закончится. Uh, yeah, and so just like as a brief introduction to the uh, kind of uh, nature of the work and uh, yeah, being, you know, still in touch with your family, even, you know, despite the war and despite the occupation and uh, yeah, feeling in a way, you know, disconnected also because it's, yeah, it's just, you know, uh, some people are not so because of a number of reasons because they want to like risk uh, and security uh, and stuff they don't want to like travel to the occupied territories uh, even though it technically can be possible but yeah it's all complicated so yeah so you kind of feel disconnected with the family but then i really love this work because uh it tells it kind of like you humanizes uh, and tells the personal stories of people who are who stayed on the uh, in the occupied territories and are not willing or not able to relocate uh, uh, to the territories that are controlled by the Ukrainian government, also because of a number of reasons. But then you know you still kind of know like that they, can, yeah, that the lives in a way continues, uh, that they continue their lives, but it's also super challenging, and uh, yeah, just interesting to learn uh, uh, about like what's going on on these territories and uh, how people keep uh, struggling uh, or keep living uh, on the occupied territories despite all the challenges uh, so there is that i just checked the time and uh, unfortunately uh, and so i just checked the time and it's 10 30 and uh, i i'll check in the uh, least if my one of my guests joined already or not yet doesn't look that ah yeah Peter Manovsky he is here hello Jenny. hello hey uh so yeah Peter Manovsky is uh, uh, another artist I will probably stop sharing my screen or no at first I will show your work like the excerpt from the uh, Baker uh game mm -hmm. like the Baker, Baker game and then we can, you know, you can tell about the work a little bit about the game. Uh, yeah. So first, I'll show show the excerpt. While I'm showing the screen. Cool. Thanks you for coming. Thanks you for joining. I really appreciate that. Uh, okay. okay.
<laughs> okay, so this was this small excerpt. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, yep, uh, Piotr. Uh, so uh, can you tell a little bit about the the work and about the game itself? Maybe a little bit about like what are the rules of the game and why uh, did you decide to in a way we produce or recreate this game now? Because this work is relatively recent. I think we uh, we kind of played the game in 2018 or something during your birthday. And uh, yeah, so why you decided to reproduce the game? Uh, what how does it relate to your personal or individual story? What did it mean to you to play this game when you were a child? Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. I could see you have some pictures of you. Uh, and Ilya tell me that yes, you are interested in art. I uh, am now in Kiev. It's dark. Uh, and yeah, I do some art projects mostly this connected with video have done few films uh, recently there was one on efflux uh, and most of them are connected with a uh, with a war uh, as Ilya told you uh, a lot uh, at least the yeah, last 10 minutes and my pieces also i'm originally from donetsk and uh, yeah, one of the person who left, we thought that in a couple of weeks it would stop. And uh, for seven years, I haven't been in the place where I was born because, uh, yeah, because um, the possible price for it is uh, tortures by pro-Russian occupants. Uh, and in, in my works, I try to, to research what's... Yeah, this this situation where you uh, miss something, miss your home, uh, and what does war mean, and what Donetsk, yeah, some cultural aspects of it, and uh, this game, uh, yeah, in this name, I consider would be baker, yeah, someone who bake some bread, some, yeah, some food. Uh, we played in my childhood uh, during uh, school uh, lessons. Uh, we, we don't have Zoom. We, we sometimes escape. Sometimes it was uh, yeah, some other classes, but we uh, play on a field. Uh, yeah, hardcore. Yeah, it's it's not not sport field where you could comfortably fall down and uh, on a, a grass, but. Uh, there's a cement uh, and we have um, yeah, on a video there were only three prayers me and uh, yeah, one friend Vitali but originally it's like uh, 20 people playing this game and uh, there are one who is a baker and um, his role uh, his task to give this uh, this function to someone else this is main his role and others they are throwing uh, sticks and hit this pyramid yes yeah, some bottles that are in the middle mm, it's a little bit brutal game uh, but uh, yes yeah, so you could hit some of your friends uh, but it provides some yeah uh, adrenaline, uh, young uh, yeah, teenagers play and a uh, little bit hit each other. But uh, a few years ago, when I was invited to uh, present some thoughts about, uh, about Donetsk, about the culture situation, I remember this game uh, in the way that um, it reproduced, yeah, now being adult, I realize that it reproduced some rules uh, of, of the society, a system of power and privileges. Because in that game, uh, if you hit these uh, bottles, then you become closer to it. Yeah, so if you have some money, then it's easier for you to earn more. If you have some privileges, then it's grow up and more and more. Yeah, so in my opinion, uh, in, yeah, normally it should be yeah, as in sport, if you if you have some achievements, then you should have higher level. 
uh, it should be this way. But in this game, uh, it's uh, this controversy that uh, correlates for me with uh, yeah, society principles that we have. Uh, and yeah, it was fun to play it uh, yes, on a birthday to remind and critically think about it uh, as yeah, unconscious systems and uh, traditions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, for uh, for this uh, great answer. And yeah, it was a lot of fun to play the game. And I do remember, I mean, I, like in, back in Mariupol, I don't think we played the same exact game, but we definitely played a similar game, like uh, um, Garrett Key or the Cities. Yeah, we also like have to throw the stick and then kind of, yeah, I think it has similar rules. But what I find really interesting, like this few elements that you mentioned, like first how the game itself, maybe in a way, reproduce certain like social uh, rules or social norms within the game itself, right? Within rules, and how, yeah, it's in, in a way definitely interesting to think about it, uh, and yeah, and like critically uh, question this uh, how the game, how games shape our, us uh, uh, in our childhood, and what are the, uh, yeah, how these rules of these games actually in a way create this uh, uh, what they supposed to or what they kind of supposed to create as like as uh, as you know grown up people like what um, ideals or values we learn from playing these games on the one hand but on the other hand what I find really interesting is also like this cultural specificity to the region and to the area and then the nature of the game itself how you know simple you can just take sticks you can have a bottle and I mean I think it's actually like that's very interesting but in a way, it's a simplified version of uh, Great Key because for Great Key, you have to build, you know, some things, and sometimes people would have to carve it or. Uh, and, and, yeah, mm -hmm. and you don't hit each other in in Great yeah, Key. You right. don't uh, you have fight. <laughs> right, right, but also like the okay. idea is that you just have a bottle, right? It's easy, you know. Every kind of person basically can get an access to the bottle and then to a stick and then you know play the game, and so it also kind of represents a lot, like the times when we were growing up in the region, because I also like remember we were like playing very simple games. We didn't have like a lot of resources, a lot of toys, a lot of things, you know, to uh, buy, you know, we just like, you just come up with things uh, almost like, uh, yeah, just whatever you have uh, around you uh, yeah, that you don't have to pay for, you just, you know, take these things and then play games and then still have fun, uh, yeah. Cool. Yes, uh, and thank, thank you for the game and yeah, for inviting to, to few, say a few words about it. Mm -hmm. for, cool. So uh, students. now we can have five, five minutes left, uh, five minutes left before the Q&A session. I can still show you a short video by another uh, artist, Pablo Hello, uh, from uh, he's from Luhansk originally, but now he uh, also lives in Kiev and he made this other video about uh, about games actually and about one game that becomes kind of popular in Ukraine right now and it's called uh, it is called J uh, Jura and you know it gains popularity but it's also like a very kind of patriotically oriented game so it's like a military kind of game and yeah it's interesting I I'll show you the video like just a an excerpt from the uh, from the video uh, Peter are you gonna leave or I do want to stay oh yeah Peter left <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'll show you the excerpt from the uh, from the video, and then uh, we can have a Q and A or a conversation. So yeah, just give me a second. I will share my screen again. I will share my screen again. Uh, desktop share, uh, and this is the work. Uh, the title of the work, Structures of Care, uh, the year 2018. Um, yeah, and so it's like a 10 minute work, but I will just show you a few excerpts. Uh. <laughs> Minus 
Два! Минус десять! Дисципліна – наш порядок! Дисципліна – наш порядок! And yeah, so I'll just think that's enough to get <clears throat> a general impression about the uh, video, about the work. But basically, the idea that there are just like kind of just juxtaposed like some actual military training videos and then some uh, videos of um, young people playing this game or like drew a game or just in general like a uh, certain like game uh, like playground situation, but that involves like um, some form of guns or um, yeah, like machine guns or whatever. And the thing is that this Dura game, it's kind of, I don't think it's um, mandated by the state, but it's definitely like the popularity of the game grows, uh, grows in uh, schools all around Ukraine. And like the problem is that, uh, or like one of the, uh, concerns is that in a way the how the Ukrainian society is getting militarized in general and how uh, this kind of games influence young people right like the games that in a way encourage them to or like train them to uh, become like or to admire some form of like military uh, uh, I don't know military uh types of engagement with with the world <laughs> and no military uh type like form of play uh so yeah that's uh, i find very important to like like very important to highlight like this process that is happening in the ukrainian society this development that's happening in the ukrainian society and yeah, there is like definitely a huge, or not even a huge, I think there is not enough conversation actually about it right now happening in Ukraine, but definitely it's something worth uh, attention and worth uh, uh, to be discussed and uh, questioned. Yeah, I think that's it. I'm, uh, I ran, uh, I ran uh, out of time. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Ilya, so much. So lovely to hear from um, artists from Ukraine and to see what different practices look like. And I think I see a question. Mo, are you raising your hand? Would you like to ask a question? I do have a question. Um, when is the um, art from around the world coming to um, the King School? Uh, uh, sorry, could, could you repeat the question? Where, where? I think is... Mo's asking when art from around ah, the world might when, be. when, when, okay. I thought where, uh, that's a great question. Uh, hopefully, um, uh, in the next, 
months. Uh, so yeah, while the school is uh, or was on the lockdown, I think now the situation is changing uh, slightly. Yeah, but uh, I think I will kind of stick around like, because I'm I'm graduating only into 2022. So next year, uh, next summer, and by that summer we you know will be working uh, together with students to get art from around the world and from Ukraine as well to Keen School. And uh, yeah, this process may take a while. I don't have exact dates, hopefully sooner than later, but um, sometime definitely before uh, summer 2022. Sounds great, Ilya, we can't wait. Uh, there's <laughs> a few other questions. This one came in from YouTube from Mo, a different Mo. Um, let's see here. Mo would like to know if you could describe the role of the body in your exploration of the political conflicts. So how does the body play into your work when you're thinking about political conflict? Oh, wow. That's a very, uh, uh, very interesting question. I think in my own work, I, yeah, I don't really know if I pay some specific attention or if if I haven't even like have been thinking about it a lot. Uh, I think like in general, it's definitely super important element of the uh, whatever political political conflict is taking place, how it is affecting our bodies in terms of in many different ways, but also like how the body becomes more, even more vulnerable to the, uh, to the environment or yeah, basically to the environment and how in a way sometimes it gets displaced, sometimes it gets, yeah, it's just like becomes much more, uh, like the surroundings becomes much more dangerous. So definitely, and then also like in terms of, okay, I, I'll try to think about myself in a way and how the war affected my body maybe not directly but just through the or by the fact that in a way i i'm connected to the region even though i'm not down there right now and even though i haven't been living there for a while but then my family still lived there and i was like and yeah and they go there back and forth uh, in, in a way uh, and i feel like to me definitely when i go there I feel less secure and the body gets more like there's a lot of different uh, structural things that emerged during the conflict, like militarization of the region. And then your body have to go through, you know, military checkpoints and you feel yourself like super vulnerable in this kind of circumstance. And then also have this, again, like s surroundings or environment and uh, you're kind of don't know what to expect and i remember when i went there like in 2014 there was this moment when i was just you know walking into my neighborhood going down to the sea just to see you know the sea because i haven't been there for a while uh, because i yeah hadn't been there for a while and then i'm like moving down to the sea and then i hear like shelling like bombing happening you know somewhere far away probably but then i hear the sound that you know basically like rocket launchers or something and then you feel like very yeah, it's a very weird feeling when you don't really you don't know what you can do actually and you kind of suspect that it's happening kind of far away so you can keep doing what you were doing or yeah but then the vulnerability like just the sensitivity or sensibility to the environment and then being like uh yeah feeling danger it's very present and i mean present even when you leave the place because then you also know that if your family is still there and then if it's all happening down there, it's kind of still affects, it keeps affecting you even if you're not present there. But for people who are there, it's just, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine who went through all of this, you know, military conflict and who still, and who still like, stay in there. It's just, yeah, it's unbelievable. I'm, I don't, yeah, I can't really imagine what they're going through right now and what their bodies are going through right now. So. Um. Thank you, Ilya. And Mo, thank you for a great question there. Um, Kenton is wondering, how does the art artistic practice of others, both from your region and beyond it, impact or influence your own work? 
Um, I think um, yeah, I think like with my specific case, I'm definitely inspired by works of other artists and that's probably the nature of my own curiosity, you know, to see and to learn about works of other artists and specifically in case of artists from the region or artists from Ukraine, for sure, because with some people you're like in conversation. So it's not only like you know about their work or you see what they're doing, but you're also in conversation, like having conversations with these people and definitely creates, it definitely like creates influence on my self as a person, as a human, but also on the work I'm doing as an artist. So I think, yeah, it has a major, uh, major influence on, on my work. Thank you. And then we have time for one more question here. Um, Nicholas mentions uh, that simple games using things in your environment is a really interesting way to reflect on the society's norms that get projected onto kids. And so Nick is wondering, do you think that simple games that kids make, um, do they teach us who we are today? Uh, wow, that's, <laughs> wow, thank you for this amazing question. Yeah, I also, I, uh, I think so. I think so. And I think like in specifically what uh, Peter mentioned, uh, but also uh, uh, Pavlo Hello, like this uh, last work that I showed, uh, I think he's specifically interested in like, some of his research and like fo like focus for his artistic research is specifically Soviet games. And uh, in this way, he attempts to actually, yeah, learn about not only the games themselves and not only about the society that produced these games, but also like how these games impacted, impacted us uh, as, uh, as of now, like how, yeah, what impact this game those games had on us uh and yeah i definitely feel there is this connection and that the games uh that we played definitely inform our consciousness to some degree and maybe to some major degree even uh and this why in the soviet union i think similar things were happening in the united states as well like this is why in the Soviet Union, the state was so eager to design games even like, you know, because sometimes you had, even in your question, you mentioned like, oh, so there are these games that uh, young people kind of came up with themselves, right? But then the state also, in, at least in the Soviet Union, the state was trying to have this monopoly in a way to produce games, to produce rules for the games and to try to distribute these games. So people would play all over the place, similar games, but they will, uh, in a way, uh, convey certain values to the uh, young people, right? And in a way, they organized this group of, of uh, uh, for children that were pioneers, like the name was literally pioneers, but this was young, uh, kind of communists, basically. Uh, and so it's similar to, uh, girl or boy scouts in the United States. Uh, yeah, how, you know, the state you know, tried to create this movement that would uh, incorporate children and incorporate their like leisure time. So in a way like and kind of orchestrate it or try to design it in a way that will benefit the state because it will convey certain values to this uh, uh, young uh, people. So yeah, I feel like definitely the games inform us a lot and the games uh, influence young people a lot. And uh, this is why states also sometimes try to take over, uh, I don't know, not game industry, but you know, create and design games in specific ways so they can uh, convey certain values and teach certain values to, to young people. Thank you so much, Ilya, for a great presentation and really wonderful answers to these really, really fantastic questions.
Um, we are so pleased to have been able to work with you this year as part of the Remote Artist in Residency and Lecture Series program. And we really look forward to how the work will live in the school when we are back there in person. Um, we really appreciate your time and thanks to your guests for coming out and hanging out with us. Um, I wanna thank Mo for a wonderful introduction this morning. And I wanna let everybody know that we'll see you back here same time next week. That's 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time um, to hear more about the work of Portland-based artist Intisar Abiocho. If you'd like to revisit this lecture, it will be archived on the KS Mocha YouTube channel. Um, and you can kind of go back and, and see some more details or rehear the things that Leah shared with us today. Um, if you'd like to see the full schedule for spring term, you can take a look at that at ksmocha.com. And we just really appreciate everybody here with us today. Thank you kids for joining us on the YouTube channel. And we'll see everybody again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.